everyone, Kelsey and Alex here. Welcome back to another CDHF Talks, with today's topic being pancreatic health and the gut microbiome. The pancreas is one of the body's most underappreciated organs. It lives in the top of our abdomens and is tucked right behind our stomachs. It's responsible for two functions, endocrine and exocrine. We'll talk a little bit more about those later. Now when the pancreas doesn't work properly, you could develop conditions such as pancreatitis or pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, or PEI for short. When you have PEI, your body doesn't get the nutrients it needs because it can no longer absorb fats and some vitamins and minerals from foods. As a result, you may lose weight or have pain in your gut. There are prescription medications that are available that work for most people. These medications help us to redevelop a new supply of enzymes that help us to digest our food in the right way. Besides medication, another way to manage symptoms is to eat the correct diet, which you can have recommended to you by a dietitian or your doctor. Further to that, research into the area of the gut microbiome is continuing to evolve in the area of PEI and the pancreas. And they're currently looking at how altering the gut microbiome could have therapeutic value. We're lucky enough today to be sitting with gastroenterologist Dr. David Armstrong, who'll be talking to us about pancreatic health, treatment options that are currently available, as well as current research that's being done into the role of the microbiome and how it affects symptoms. So let's get to it. The pancreas is a fascinating organ. It's probably one of the, the body's less appreciated organs. Um, it's a piece of sort of soft tissue at the upper part of the abdomen at the back. And it's really only, it's about six inches long and it weighs about two to three and a half ounces. And its job really is to help with digestion and to control the events that happen after digestion with the absorption of food. It actually encompasses a number of different functions. Part of it is what's called the endocrine pancreas. That is, it's an endocrine gland that produces insulin and glucagon. These are hormones that control blood sugar levels. What we're going to be talking about today is more about the exocrine pancreas, which is uh, the part of the gland that secretes fluid and other proteins and other things into the gut to help the uh, small intestine digest food after we've eaten it. So the exocrine part of the pancreas, its exocrine function is based on secreting fluid and bicarbonate to neutralize acid produced by the stomach and enzymes to help digest food. So once food has left the stomach and gone into the small bowel, it gets mixed with pancreatic secretions and bile and they work together to break the food down into its components. And to do that, they mix it up with fluid, they neutralize the acid with bicarbonate, and then these pancreatic enzymes mix with the food and break the big chunks of carbohydrate and fat and protein down into their components, things like sugars, um, fatty acids, and amino acids. So, what happens when the pancreas goes wrong? One of the problems that occurs then is related to the endocrine part of it. So if there's a lot of damage to the pancreas, then we can get reduction in the production of insulin and glucagon, and that's what leads to diabetes mellitus. If there is destruction or injury to the exocrine part of the pancreas, then there is a loss of these digestive enzymes and fluid and bicarbonate that help digest food, and that leads on to maldigestion, malabsorption, malnutrition, and weight loss. So what is it that causes the exocrine pancreas to go wrong? Well, there are a number of things that can lead to this. Some things actually occur at or before birth. These are hereditary conditions, for example, like cystic fibrosis or other less common conditions that affect children like Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome. But most loss of pancreatic function comes later in life and comes due to injury or inflammation of the pancreas that can be caused by infections, such as viral infections, for example, mumps. It can be caused commonly by gallstones, which are produced in the gallbladder and then go down and block the drainage duct of the pancreas so that it can't drain properly. And this causes the pancreas to become blocked off and secrete enzymes that damage the pancreas. Or it can occur because of external 
toxins, things that cause damage to the pancreas, things like alcohol and some of the medications that we take. So all of these, when they cause damage to the pancreas, cause loss of the pancreatic cells, the ductal cells that produce uh, water and bicarbonate, the um, asinine cells that produce the enzymes, and when these are damaged, they can't produce their secretions, and that leads to the loss of pancreatic function. This is what's called pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. Pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, or PEI, follows on from damage to the pancreas, and this is usually related to chronic pancreatitis with scarring and inflammation. When that happens, the pancreas is not then able to produce the fluid and the enzymes and the bicarbonate to secrete into the small bowel to mix with food. And when that happens, the food, instead of being broken up and digested, then scurries on down the small bowel into the large bowel without being fully digested. And this has a number of consequences. Firstly, as you can expect, if the food isn't broken down and digested, it can't be absorbed into the body, and that then leads to malnutrition. Lack of calories, lack of protein, lack of fats, means that people tend to lose weight. But it's more complicated than that because, for example, fats carry on board vitamins, what are called fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. And the pancreatic enzymes also help absorb vitamin B12. So if there is malabsorption, then not only do we lose the so-called macronutrients that help us maintain or gain weight, but we also lose the micronutrients, and so we can suffer from vitamin deficiencies. The other thing that happens with this is that because the food is not absorbed, it then passes out of the small bowel into the large bowel. And the large bowel is not really designed for absorbing nutrients. What it does is generally is to absorb fluid from the stool. And in the large bowel, that's where we have all of the bacteria, the so-called microbiome. And when the bacteria in the microbiome are given this food that's not been absorbed in the small bowel, they then start to break it down and they produce chemicals and other things that trigger the large bowel to move more rapidly. And so we get the other things that occur with pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, which is that the unabsorbed food then passes rapidly through the large bowel. It causes diarrhea, which is watery stools, or even what's called steatorrhea, which is fatty, oily, or greasy stools that are difficult to flush away. And because of the rapid transit and because it triggers the bowel to contract more rapidly and move things along, and because the bacteria break the food down and produce gas, people with PEI have abdominal pain, they have cramps, they have gas, and they have to go to the bathroom frequently, and they pass these watery, oily stools that are difficult to flush away. So we've heard that pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, or PEI, is a real problem for people who have loss of pancreatic function. And the question then is, what can we do about it? Because it really is unpleasant not to be able to absorb food, to have malabsorption and maldigestion. Well, part of the solution is the way that we eat. Because, as you can imagine, if the pancreas is not able to produce enough enzymes to digest the food, then the excess will run through the bowel more rapidly. If we eat small meals and eat them more frequently, then there's a better chance that the small amount of enzymes and fluid and bicarbonate produced by the pancreas will actually be enough to help digest that meal and will overcome some of the problems related to malabsorption and maldigestion. However, in many people that's not enough, and so what we have to do is try and replace the enzymes that the pancreas is not able to produce. This is called pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, or PERT. And it is possible and has been for many years to get pancreatic enzyme replacement medications, so-called digestive supplements. And these are capsules or tablets that contain the enzymes that would normally be produced by the pancreas. So we have enzymes called amylases that break down carbohydrates. We have lipases that break down fats. 
And we have what are called tryptases, chymotrypsin and trypsin that break down protein into the components. So it's possible to take these enzyme supplements with the meals so that they mix with the meals and the enzymes get mixed with the food as it goes through the small bowel and that then supplements the digestion that has been affected by the loss of pancreatic function. And if the amount of enzymes is tailored to the requirements of the individual patient, then what happens is they can work out how many of these capsules, for example, they need to take with each meal to ensure full absorption of the food, to ensure that they no longer are malnourished, and to control the diarrhea and steatorrhea that they have. So with a combination of smaller, more frequent meals, taking the enzyme replacement therapy capsules mixed in with the meals, so eat a little bit, take a capsule, eat a bit, take a capsule, it's possible to return digestion almost to normal. However, that isn't the only thing that we need to do because, as we heard before, if there's malabsorption, there is also potentially loss of some of the important vitamins. So not only is it important to eat small frequent meals with the enzyme replacement therapy, it's also important to make sure that people with chronic pancreatitis and PEI take the vitamin supplements and mineral supplements that they need to maintain full health. So there are clearly a lot of symptoms that can go with pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. Often when people get symptoms, they think that it must be related directly to the pancreas. And whilst it is possible that pancreatic inflammation, whether it's acute pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis, can produce pain from the pancreas itself, many of the symptoms that people get with PEI are because of the malabsorption of food, which then leads to the rapid transit, the gas, the bloating, and the cramps, and that's more related to diet, and this can be managed by close attention to diet and pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy rather than worrying that the pain is an indication of continuing damage to the pancreas itself. One of the problems with pancreatic exocrine insufficiency is that it produces a range of symptoms, and some of those may be similar to other conditions. So it's important to know what to look for because, in fact, pancreatic enzyme insufficiency or pancreatic endocrine insufficiency is often the last thought that some physicians have when they see patients with appropriate symptoms or relevant symptoms. So if someone thinks that they have pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, what sort of things should they look for? Well, we've heard that a deficiency of pancreatic enzymes leads to malabsorption, and so clearly it makes common sense that if somebody is losing weight and there isn't a good reason for it, if they're tired because they're not absorbing nutrients, these are things that can go with pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. Because of the malabsorption, Patients may also have diarrhea or even greasy stools or steatorrhea. And they may also be anemic because of difficulty absorbing some of the micronutrients and iron and vitamin B12 that are needed for the body to produce uh, blood. Deficiencies in one of the fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin K, can also lead to uh, increased bleeding or increased bruising, so people may notice that they have bruising. And then the other thing that can happen with the deficiency in the fat-soluble vitamin D is that they may run into troubles with bone health, with osteoporosis, osteopenia, or osteomalacia, so that they have bone pain or an increased risk of fractures. One of the really hot topics in gastroenterology and in medicine and health today is the gut microbiome. And generally what we mean by the gut microbiome are the bacteria in the large bowel or colon. There are a huge number of bacteria in the colon. It's estimated that there are somewhere between 30 and 400 billion bacteria. As a Brit, that's European billion. That's 10 with 12 zeros after it. So 30 to 400 billion bacteria is a huge number of bacteria. And it's about one to 1.5 times the number of cells that we find in the human body. So there is an argument that we're actually a microbiome on legs rather than that we as humans have a microbiome. Why is it important? Well, 
The bacteria in the bowel have to live, and to live, they have to get food. And that food comes from the food that we eat that doesn't get digested. So any condition like PEI that leads to malabsorption, maldigestion, alters the food that is delivered to the bacteria in the bowel. And it has the potential, therefore, to alter the microbiome. So because of this, it's clear that patients who have pancreatic exocrine insufficiency will have a change in the microbiome because there's a change in the nutrients that are delivered to the colon and to the microbiome. What's not clear is how important that is. But we certainly do have data now that show that even in healthy individuals, differences in the amount of pancreatic enzymes that they secrete will lead to differences in their microbiome. We know also that patients with inflammation of the pancreas, for example, autoimmune idiopathic pancreatitis, will also have changes in their microbiome related to the extent to which the pancreas has been inflamed and is unable to work properly. So clearly, Changes in the pancreas and the production of enzymes will lead to changes in the microbiome, and replacement of those enzymes will also lead to changes in the microbiome. And again, there are studies that show that if you take healthy people or healthy animals in experimental studies, that if you replace them or give them extra pancreatic enzymes, this then leads to changes in the bacteria. And for example, uh, studies in mice have shown that pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy in healthy mice leads to an increase in so-called healthy bacteria such as Akkermansia mucinophila or Lactobacillus reuteri. Now again, we don't know whether this would improve health in humans, but it does suggest that pancreatic function and pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy are important and are important determinants of our microbiome and our overall health. So there's increasing evidence that people who have pancreatic exocrine insufficiency will have changes in their microbiome, and also that changes in the microbiome can affect the way that the pancreas works. This is gonna be interesting as more research is conducted in this area. It's certainly unclear whether or not pancreatic enzyme supplements will help people who are already healthy but for those who have pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, there is now very clear evidence that they will benefit from appropriate pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, and that this may well produce other beneficial changes in the way their gut works and in their microbiome.